Welcome back uh, to Summit. We will be kicking off our second session for Leading Through Conflict, Seven Ways Leaders Demonstrate a Peacemaker Mindset. Uh, in our first session, we talked about active constructive responses to conflict. In this session, we'll be talking about passive constructive responses to conflict. Uh, as you know, relying on constructive behaviors before, during, and after a conflict can move the experience from a tension-filled experience uh, to one that is energizing and productive. And so in this session, we will explore the practices of delaying responding, reflective thinking, and adapting. Um, these responses to conflict calm our brains and allow us to view the conflict from a wider angle. Uh, and so by definition, these, these responses are done alone. One of the things um, that I love about this uh, these responses uh, is that they're not widely looked at. Oftentimes we think if we're not doing something with the other person, then we are avoiding the conflict. Um, and so I feel like these responses are kind of the hidden secrets to the conflict dynamics model. Uh, so I find them extremely valuable. And so here uh, to talk about these responses uh, today, we have uh, Kippy Fleming. Uh, Kippy is a conflict is the conflict management program director at ACU uh, in the Dallas campus. Um, she is a member of the Sunset Church of Christ in Lubbock. Um, as a practicing mediator, uh, Kippy works primarily with families in divorce and child custody disputes. Uh, Kippy's research interests include family conflict, gender and conflict, leadership in conflict, church conflict, and conflict in American history. And Kippy has three uh, wonderful adult uh, children. Kippy, thank you for being with us today. Uh, Joey Halbert is also here. Uh, Joey Halbert is an attorney a mediator based in Central Texas. His favorite kind of legal work involves leaning into the counselor at law position of his license by helping clients fully think about their decisions um, and acting prudently and gracefully. Joey is married to Samantha and they have two children. Uh, and so thank you, Joey and Kippy, for being here with us today. I'm really looking forward uh, to our discussion. Before we jump into our discussion, uh, I'm going to remind us a little bit about the conflict dynamics model. And so uh, first, um, just a reminder about how the conflict dynamics model uh, views the progression of conflict. And so, uh, we know that conflict begins, according to the conflict dynamics model, conflict begins when our hot button is pushed. And that looks like us becoming irritated or annoyed or frustrated about a given situation. And once we are frustrated, once that hot button has been pushed, we're triggered. And in that moment that we are triggered, our bodies physically react to being triggered. We have different ways that we, we can learn about our body and how, uh, how our body experiences being triggered. And so uh, we joked in the last session, I confess that my husband has taught me that I do this thing where I kick my foot when I'm triggered. And him pointing that out to me has been very, very, very helpful um, because it lets me know that uh, I, I am likely to respond to what is about to happen next in a defensive way because I'm triggered because I've perceived whatever has just happened as a threat. Um, and so I'm getting ready to protect and defend myself. Um, and so as we think about um, leading congregations and leading churches, um, one of the most difficult parts of doing that is disrupting that very automatic response we have when we perceive a threat um, and being defensive. And so once we're defensive and once we're triggered, we have a moment where we uh, then can decide how we want to respond to the conflict. And most often, if there's no awareness there, we will 
out of protection for ourselves, respond to the conflict uh, in a way that is destructive. And so as a result, tensions increase, uh, the conflict escalates and usually gets a little bit bigger. That can look like us then triggering the other person. And so now they're triggered and they're protecting themselves back back to us. And so then we begin a cycle of destructive conflict. That's very normal and very common because both, both parties then are protecting themselves. So it's really powerful to me about how uh, this model looks at the progression of conflict is that that moment that we realize we're triggered, we don't have to respond in that automatic way where we protect ourselves. What we can do is realize that we are triggered and choose to respond in a way that would actually de-escalate the conflict, um, that might build relationship with the other person, but we have to disrupt something that's very human in us when we do that. Um, and so uh, we know that um, we can respond constructively to conflict uh, where we reach out and talk to the other person and take the other person's perspective, maybe create solutions with the other person, um, express our emotions. Those are the active responses. And so today we're going to talk about the passive responses. What can we do that only involves ourselves and also could de-escalate the tension in a conflict. So looking here uh, at this model again, we talked about these uh, responses earlier and now we'll be talking about these three. So remember these are still constructive because they de-escalate the tension, uh, but they're also passive. So they only involve us. Um, let me give a little more insight. So we have our book here that we're working from, uh, The Conflict Competent Leader from the Center for Creative Leadership. And uh, really why we brought this material to Summit is because it's, it doesn't necessarily have a church connotation, but uh, the principles can still be applied to the church context to be very helpful, but you might not find it in the church conflict section or even um, uh, searching that in Amazon or something. So we want to shed light on this resource. So let me read a little bit more about each of these. So reflective thinking helps us respond to conflict by analyzing the situation and weighing the pros and cons before proceeding. So in short, this helps us choose the best next step. The benefits of reflective thinking are significant, but maybe a little less obvious than some of the other responses. One major factor that contributes to the escalation of conflict is the hasty and unplanned response. Uh, in those moments where we respond quickly, most of the time we don't realize the consequences of our own actions and words because we haven't had time to consider those consequences. So reflective thinking can be a powerful tool for avoiding those ill-advised responses. So the better you understand uh, the likely outcomes from your actions as you respond to conflict, the better you will be at choosing the most effective uh, response. So that's reflective thinking. Delaying responding. This allows us to respond to conflict by taking a time out. Uh, when our emotions are running high and we just need some time to settle down. Remember, this is very, we are just humans here. Just because you are leading a church does not mean uh, that, uh, that you won't be triggered and you won't feel strong emotions in the moment. Um, uh, that is just normal and natural um, to the human condition. And so the primary advantage that results uh, from being willing to delay responding is that we become less likely to respond in rash emotional ways. Delaying a response in effect just buys us time so that we can let our immediate emotional responses dissipate. And it allows us then to refocus our attention on how to um, resolve the conflict. 
Um, a secondary advantage to delaying responding is that it gives us more time to think reflectively. So just like the active responses go together, these passive responses do as well. And then adapting. Adapting helps us respond to conflict by staying flexible and optimistic and trying to make the best of the situation. Adapting is about both mindset and behavior. Being adaptable does not mean giving in or giving up. Rather, it means acknowledging that conflict in life is inevitable, which is a key assumption uh, to this model, but still remaining optimistic that it is ultimately resolvable or manageable. The adaptable person remains alert for signs that the other person may be ready to talk again or move toward resolving the conflict. The adaptable person also is willing to turn loose of the timeline and turn loose of um, the issues that maybe can't be resolved immediately. And the end result of someone who can deal with difficult conflicts but still remain positive and optimistic, um, this just leaves so much room for the relationship to still stay intact, which if we're, if we're trying to look at conflict as an opportunity for transformation, if we are accepting conflict as a natural part of um, our congregational lives, um, if we are looking at conflict as an opportunity to build relationship, uh, then adapting is very, very important. So I just want to welcome you guys. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we're really looking forward to picking your brains um, and hearing uh, your expert opinions about how do we really live out these passive um, responses to conflict. And so um, let me just start with, um, as we were walking through the slides, uh, Joey Halbert, what stood out to you? I think, um... Attorney wise, I like to play with words or ideas or make little distinguishing things a little bit. And I appreciate that you reiterated that passive doesn't mean that nothing is happening. It means that we're not directly, um, maybe substantively interacting with uh, the other party at that time. And I, I think um, this is something that's interesting to me because I'm so bad at it. Um, naturally it's my nature to um i mean i'm, I'm a lawyer there's like <laughs> there's scales behind me justice is important to me and if there seems like a wrong i want to get on it but that's not always um the best way to do that is not always to jump on things immediately and um some of the behaviors maybe i learned in law school i unlearned through uh peacemaking training in um the idea of passivity or silence is um, silence isn't the absence of something, it's the fullness of something. Uh, Henry Nowen and uh, The Way of the Heart talks about this. Um, Into the Silent Land, who the, the author is escaping me right now, but this idea that if you fully know someone and are fully in communion with someone, be it God or another person, you don't really have to talk because you, there's a knowing. There's a, a unity, think about the Trinity, to that. Um, and so don't think about silence or passivity as this kind of like um, running away from the problem. Um, although you might be, in, and that's what I typically did until last year, so we can talk about that later. But um, the, fir the first thing I thought of was don't equate passive for, for what we're using here is, is not addressing the situation. I love that, Joey, uh, that idea that um, this is really where some, uh, maybe the most important work can be done on ourselves, right? The um, uh, love that idea of um, it's not uh, silence is an emptiness, but it's fullness. And, um, and I think uh, what you're bringing in here is really the spiritual layer on top of these responses. And so thank you for for adding that to this conversation. Uh, Kippy, what would you add to what Joey said or something else that stood out to you um, just as we were reviewing the model? 
Oh, so much <laughs> was going through my mind when, when you uh, reviewed all of those, Laurieann, all the times that we've been together in residency and talked about these things. Um, but I, I think probably the, 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 the thing that came immediately to mind was um, when you were talking about uh, when a person is triggered. I'm teaching a course right now. Just last week, we talked about you know things that trigger us, but we also talked about things that we do that trigger other people. And so this is also that part of that reflection. And it's not just me that's being triggered sometimes. That self-awareness that says, wow, what am I doing? What am I contributing to this situation that is keeping us from finding a resolution and the ability and the willingness to look at ourselves and say wow what i did added to this escalation and that's tough because um we 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 tend to be pretty lenient and generous with ourselves because we understand our motivation we understand Oh, well, that's not what I meant. I meant it. I meant, uh, you know, I had a good intent. Um, Hawker and Wilmot, one of the best uh, textbooks on, on conflict management. The, one of the shortest sentences in the entire book, and I think one of the most important, and I tell my students to remember this, is intent does not equal impact. And so I have to be aware that just because I meant something a certain way and I meant it in a positive, helpful way, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that that's going to be the way it's received. And again, we flip that. I have to understand that when I'm triggered because someone did something, I need to give them the benefit of the doubt and be open to think about the fact that Maybe just because I took it a certain way doesn't mean that's the way it was intended. Are you saying that we should treat others the way that we want to be treated, Kippy? You know, we should write that one down, Joey. Oh my, that's a great there's idea. There's something to that phrase. Yeah. Interesting. I, I love that, uh, uh, Kippy, what you just said. Um, uh, that reflective thinking can give us the opportunity to almost can con we're confessing privately right we're confessing to god um our ownership our contribution to the conflict and i think um there's more airtime given to confessing to the other person or um uh, apologizing um but really the first step is is even seeing it ourselves, right? Um, and the reality is we need a little time uh, to be able to do that. We need, uh, we need that space um, for that, uh, that wholeness that, that Joey Halbert was mentioning earlier. Love that. Um, uh, Joey, as you think about uh, the challenges that church leaders are in are experiencing right now in the middle of a pandemic, um, we're in an election year, um, really amazing opportunities right now to have um, important and in-depth conversations around racial equity. Um, as you imagine, church leaders um, navigating the landscape uh, of the church just in 2020. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge uh, to uh, these passive, passive responses? I think um, I'm, I've worked at a church for a couple of years. Um, I interned as a youth minister, but I'm not in full-time ministry. But even though I'm not a minister, I know some. And it, it seems to me that nonprofits and also churches both can have the same issue where um, it's not like work where you might not like it, but you get a paycheck and so you keep coming back. And unfortunately, um, instead of seeing our church as, as a body, sometimes maybe because we're scared of conflict or um, maybe we're too into it, we, we instead um, just leave. 
And I think probably what's scary for a lot of people within churches right now is if people aren't happy with any particular stance or the way that something is handled, whether it's these issues you're talking about or anything else, uh, lawn care of the church, then people might just head on out and, and go down the street or something. And so um, I think if there is that fear, it can be hard to know you want to do something immediately, maybe, or you just want to avoid, which is kind of a, a negative passive behavior. So you might go too much at something or you might stay too far back because you have the same fear of not wanting to um, lose people or not being sure what the exact right thing is to do. Um, this is this is borderline um, passive, but I think one thing you can do if someone brings something to your attention um, through email or a text or a call, um, especially if it's an asynchronous thing like email, just <laughs> let them know you received it and that you appreciate them sharing and giving you an opportunity to explain more about it and that you really wanna give them the answer that they deserve. And so you're gonna think about it and you're gonna huddle and then um, you're gonna talk with them later. And so you're not, you're not substantively, in terms of the message, the information you're relaying, giving them an answer, but if you count the relationships as substance, which I would, um, then you are affirming that relationship and you're not really, you're affirming their dignity without saying anything. And so <laughs> I, think, I think I would consider that passive in that you're not directly answering the, the question or the issue they have, but you're engaged with them without jumping on an answer or without waiting too long and leaving them in the dark about what you're thinking. Yeah, just re reassuring them. It almost um, uh, ensures that you're holding yourself accountable, uh, that you're not avoiding, but you are letting them know, you're committing to them that you will be maybe reflective thinking, um, even though you're delaying that response. Um, but I think it also just clarifies your own motive for them, which is really important, right? If um, uh, it, would be, it would be important to reassure that person uh, that you're delaying responding so that you can think reflectively and you will circle back. And so um, I love that. Absolutely. I think it's a really practical tip. Um, Kippy, what about you? As you think about the landscape of 2020 and what church leaders are really navigating right now, ministers, elders, small group leaders, you know, I think there's so many levels of um, leadership in the church. Um, what do you think, uh, what do you think would be another big challenge um, in using these passive responses? Well, um, I too have worked in a church. I was a children's minister for six years. Um, and so and at, before, at some point in my life, I've also been a, a secretary. So, I mean, I've worked at the admin level. I've worked at the ministry level. Um, so I've seen so much of this. And I wish I had known then more what I know now um, about all of these things that we're talking about. But um, going back to the course that I'm teaching right now, one of the things that I have students do is we talk about identity and how important identity is and the fact that we all have multiple facets of our identity. And I have them draw a picture um, and it's like concentric circles. And in the very middle is that they list the things that are the closest to who they believe they are at their very core. And, you know, talking about the whole the pandemic and everything that's going on, almost every student will list their faith as part of that very center. And then close, and then as the, the circles go out, the things that are less and less important, but still part of the identity. And usually very close into the center, is their, their, I hate to say political party, but their, their beliefs about, you know, how things should be going in the country. We, we'll put it like that. 
And so those things are, are, are hot buttons, like you talked about in the model. And when someone challenges us or we feel, intent does not equal impact, we feel like someone has challenged those things that are so very important to us, um, we have that absolutely natural emotional response. And we tend to act out naturally. And I think as church leaders, we're pro there, you guys are probably seeing that played out, um, maybe not week to week, but you see it in the congregation, and if not in the congregation, in the community. And those things are, it's not something that we can just say, you know, they're, well, they're, they just can't be important to us. The fact is they are important to us and we do have those emotional reactions when, when we feel like they have been threatened in one way or the other. Yes. And so I think like Joey was saying, acknowledging the fact that someone feels like this is something that's very, very important. It, it, it is at the center of their very being. And sometimes just the acknowledgement can can help someone feel validated um, and i think it's important for us to as leaders but also as someone who's uh, attempting to help others who are in conflict um, acknowledging that someone is feeling that way doesn't necessarily mean it's a, it's okay to feel that way or that's a good way to act or respond but validation acknowledgement i think and it's been my experience as a, as a mediator when people are validated when they're acknowledged then it tends to help toward de-escalation and helps people be willing to listen and to communicate with the other person um it it, uh, it doesn't mean that if i say okay i understand where you're coming from or i understand that you feel this way or that way. It, it doesn't mean that, that my way of thinking isn't valid. It doesn't mean that I have to abandon my thoughts, my beliefs, um, my stance on you know, any issue or whatever. It just means that I'm open to knowing that there, there may be another way of thinking about this. My way isn't the only way. Um, you have a way, I have a way. Um, let's talk about you know what we have in common and, and maybe you learn from what we have that that's different um you know i i sometimes give the example to students of you know if i go into a garden i was really really blessed a couple of years ago to get to go to um we went on an alaskan cruise and one of the places we went through was vancouver and we went to this huge botanic garden in vancouver it was stunning it was so beautifully done and if, but if I had gone to that place, if I'd gone to this wonderful garden and every flower had been the same type, the same color, with the same fragrance, I'm pretty sure it would have had quite, a, quite less of an impact. It's differences that make life interesting. They make, they make it challenging, but they also make it interesting. And so I think, something that we can focus on again as leaders is is unity rather than uniformity and not demand uniformity because we're we're human we're not always going to think alike and be alike but we have things in common so not sure if that answered your question Laurieann, but it did it did there and, and so rich uh, uh and i know that sparked something in joey halbert so i want to catch that <laughs> it did i wrote it down though so i wouldn't i wouldn't panic and forget um, to kind of adhere the the two things we were just talking about, um, a couple of years ago, I went to the Association for Conflict Resolutions National Conference, and uh, there was a panel about neuroscience and what happens to us in conflict. And what the panelists told us was that when your identity is attacked, like like Kippy was talking about, um, our minds, our lizard brains, react as if we're being physically attacked. It's the same thing that's triggered that, that core, those core identities. And they suggested that rather than um, trying to reason with that particular issue, the better thing is to appeal to another part of 
the identity of the person, uh, which is exactly what uh, Kippy is talking about. It's not uniformity. It's not that you have to agree on everything. Um, in fact, that wouldn't <laughs> that wouldn't be great. Uh, God made us. God made us, and He made us different. And the ecological models show that He likes to do that. And um, ecologically, we know that the more diverse uh, a biome is, the healthier it is, the more resilient it is. And that goes exactly to what Kippy is saying: is that um, it, it's <laughs> avoiding things doesn't solve them. Uh, it can, in, in fact, it can let them fester. And trying to fix everything directly might miss the point or the or might not work as well but it's it's the finding that identity that's the strongest that might work best uh, can i coattail on that just a bit Lorian? please do well um i think uh, i know growing up and I grew up in a little tiny country church, so it could have been different in other places. But I think for the most part, Christians have, have had this idea in our head. It, it, I, don't, I don't remember it being taught like this, but I remember it just being like this. And that is, if we're Christians, we're not going to disagree. If we're Christians, we're not going to have conflict. And I think that's probably caused as many, probably more problems than it ever solved. Um, not acknowledging that I'm hurt or not acknowledging that I've hurt someone else or, or not acknowledging that there's some serious issues that we need to talk about and work through, that, that is not healthy. That's not going to work. Just like Joey said, avoiding a problem is not going to make it go away and it's not going to make it just like it's, you know, it's not there. It is going to be there. Um, I love talking to Ben Reese, Ben at ACU, and um, one of the one of the conversations we had uh, at one time was about uh, the thirty fourth Psalm, for, uh, verse fourteen, where David says, "Seek peace and pursue it." And I said, "Okay, Ben, what what does the word pursue mean there? What's the meaning?" And he said uh, he he did some little he did a little research for me, and he got back to me, and it, he said basically it means to run after something you greatly desire. And what I took away from that conversation with, with, Reese, with Ben was that godly peace is not something that happens by accident. It is something that we have to work at and we have to, we have to as a congregation, as a people, it has to be something that we put as a priority, not because it's just going to happen if we ignore things, but to work with one another and work through conflict to help us understand each other and understand our differences and appreciate the differences. Um, and, and not just, you know, oh, if, if I don't talk about this, it'll be like it never happened, or, you know, it's better if I just ignore this. Yeah, there's some things that, you know, we probably need to be adult about and, and acknowledge that, you know, that that's really not worth talking about. But a lot of things are, and we, we damage ourselves, we damage our community when we just pretend like things are all okay. And, and talking about conflict and talking about how to work through conflict is not something that, in my experience, has been taught in the church. <clears throat> yeah, uh, um, so many things that you that you're touching on here. So the having the perspective that conflict is normal um, is is difficult just in general, right? Um, uh, the one place that I see that we expect conflict with someone that we love um, is conventional wisdom is right when you're getting married that you go to premarital counseling and the purpose of going to premarital counseling is you're, you're acknowledging we are different we are going to have conflict and we're going to prepare ourselves and equip ourselves to deal well with that conflict and um but, but, but what if we didn't expect conflict to happen in marriage right? Um, and what if every time something came up, our commitment to that relationship was on the line? Can you imagine how unsettling that would be, right? Now, um, that's a little bit though what we do at, at, 
that's what church members sometimes can do, right? And so um, we expect it to be easy. We expect this to be the place where conflict doesn't happen. When it does, it surprises us. Um, and then sometimes we throw our membership up for negotiation um, if the conflict doesn't go well. Or sometimes we're just so uncomfortable, even if we don't have a strong opinion either way about, let, let's say maybe our church is working through one of those deep, important issues that, you know, really brings about transformation. Um, but we're so uncomfortable because we feel the tension that we put our membership up for negotiation, right? Um, it's very difficult to dig in and build relationships, you know, when that's happening at church. But I, I think, um, I think that's more the norm. And I love what you're calling out, Kippy. What if that wasn't the norm? What if we expected and welcomed conflict as a part of our fabric? Um, I think it would change our mindset um, for sure. Uh, okay, so one thing uh, that we haven't hit on much yet, and I want to make sure we do, is this idea of adapting. And so this idea uh, that um, there are times that we say, uh, yes, and, and it's good for us and the other person, right? So I think of adapting as this um, saying yes as much as possible. Um, but the, the, what I read also defines adapting as can, maintaining this posture of openness to the other person, having this mindset of optimism um, that even if we don't resolve this now, um, even if, it's, if this is, let's say this is hitting on your core identity. And so I need to now, I need to let that one breathe. And I need to now loop around and connect with you about another uh, piece of your identity that maybe I share as well. Um, but we remain open to picking back up that conversation when it's, when it's safe for both of us. Um, how do you guys see that um, playing out for, in our churches? Well, I would um, see how to put this, the, the willingness to, to see a different perspective, I, I think in itself is adaptability. Um, those, those pieces of our core identity um, don't change a lot over the course of our lives. They, they, they're fluid, they're somewhat fluid. It's the farther out from the center we go, a lot more fluid, but those in the center very, very seldom move dramatically. And again, since, since faith tends to be at the center, we tend to, um, we tend to hold on to it. And, and, and faith, I'm, I'm talking about everything about, you know, from, from worship and everything, all of it, not just our belief in God, but everything that has to do with the church we tend to hold on to it and try to protect it as much as possible. I think openness um, to, you know, to any, anything at that level shows that it, it's a way of being adaptable. It, again, it doesn't mean that I have to change my mind. It just, it means that I'm open to a different opinion and a different way of thinking. And so uh, that's, Joey, I'm, I'm sure Joey has stuff to add to that, and I may come back at the end, but uh, I think just a willingness to see a different perspective is a tremendous step forward in adaptability because we, we like our comfort zones. And when we talk about stepping outside our comfort zone, that in itself is, it is a, the first step toward adaptability. Um, yes. <laughs> um, the, the, the thing that I thought about immediately was, even though I've been studying this for this area for about 15 years and also went through this kind of negotiation training in law school, um, for a long time, I thought about conflict management and peacemaking and negotiation as how to get other people to do what I want. <laughs> and, and definitely, I mean, there's a part of that. If you're negotiating, you're advocating for interests and, and if you're being collaborative, you're also listening to the interests of others. But um, 
just a couple of years ago, really, I realized, um, well, that's not, <laughs> that's not all we're doing. I, the other people have great ideas. And I, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of a project I was involved with at work here at ACU about a year ago. And I thought, well, here's the answer. And then we're going to do these meetings and then we'll get to there. But um, my colleagues just had these amazing ideas and it's way better than what I would have come up with on my own. And so the, the part about um, that Kip is talking about, about <laughs> realizing your way is not the only way. Um, there's more than one right answer and there are myriad perspectives. Um, that's really important. Also because I grew up in Austin, which is Stevie Ray Vaughan country. When I think about ad adaptability, I think about improvisation like the 12 bar blues or jazz. I know Kenneth Cloak is a conflict management writer that talks a lot about jazz, but for me, the 12 bar blues makes sense where you have this basic structure, this 12 bars of music, but what can happen when you're playing with someone else live, when you're jamming, um, it's gonna be different every time. And sometimes it's awesome and sometimes you're not quite in sync, but um, there's a, a joy in playing, uh, and just noodling around and jamming with other people because you make this new thing that, that you couldn't have done by yourself. And when I, so when I think of adaptability, I, I think about the 12 bar blues um, and the, the, the openness, creativity. Um, so, <laughs> so don't be like me and think about, well, what we're gonna do is figure out a, a prettier and, and less mean way to get to what I want. Just be open to, um, you know, God made us all and gave us all these kind of unique um, perspectives and, and together we make that body. So um, take, see it as a way to take advantage of that instead of just uh, that kind of thing. Well, that's good. Uh, I love that connection uh, to creativity and innovation uh, that happens and um, really in the, that posture of, of flexibility uh, that comes with adapting to conflict um, is key to that uh, because it's so easy to want to be rigid, at least it is for me um, uh, in conflict, kind of because of the, the natural discomfort that I feel. Um, uh, I want to pivot a little bit uh, before we wind down to uh, delaying responding. And I want us to think about um, what are the pressures we feel um, at church uh, in those moments. Maybe we're sitting in a, in a small group or a Bible class and something uh, catches us. Maybe we hear um, a trigger idea or, um, uh, but, but we realize we're triggered. What is difficult in that moment um, and, and maybe what's a message that is common that we tell ourselves, like, you know, that pressures us to respond in the moment, um, uh, that we could maybe switch to, uh, telling ourselves so that we know we give ourselves permission almost to delay responding. Um, so what do you think is difficult about that? Because, um, I think that moment is really critical to buying us time to get to that, to that reflective thinking and that adaptive uh, posture. So I see, I see the delay responding as a bridge. And so what keeps us from, from stepping over into that bridge um, and then doing that hard work, right, of adapting and um, reflective thinking? I'm just curious what you guys see there. Well, I, I would say that um, it is, it goes back to the self-awareness. I've, I've got to recognize that I'm having this physical slash emotional response to whatever I've heard. You know, I, I've asked my students, I've asked my kids, I've asked myself, how many times have you reacted to something quickly and out of emotion, you know, emotionally driven, and had the situation end positively, end well. And usually the, the answer is, you know, and like I said, I've asked myself this, usually it, it's not, it doesn't end as, it doesn't end well. And so 
I think it is, uh, it's a matter, matter of emotional intelligence. You know, go back to Goleman, all of his research on, on emotional intelligence, um, that awareness of that emotional response building up in myself and the willingness, because you have to be aware, but then you also have to be willing to not respond because it's natural to respond and it's easy to respond in the moment. And so we have to be willing to do what may be a little bit more challenging and, and that is delay. Think about, you know, not necessarily, you know, where's this other person coming from or whatever, but, but first of all, focus inwardly and be aware of that, the way that my body and my mind and my lizard brain are responding to this identity threat, because that's really usually what it is. At some level, it's an identity threat. And so my lizard brain says, I've got to defend, I've got to defend this. And so we have to get out of the lizard brain and uh, uh, think a little bit more, um, I hate to say rational because when you're, I, I'm, I'm not saying ignore your emotions. I had a student recently in a paper say, I've got to learn to ignore my emotions. And it's like, no, I don't think I said that at any point. <laughs> we have to be aware of our emotions. We have to be in control of our emotions, uh, but we don't ignore them because that just causes us inward problems um, when we just pretend like those emotions aren't there. Well, thank you, Kippy. That's wonderful. Joey, what would you add? The same thing. I, I think it's hard to delay because it's, it's not natural. Um, see something and you kind of want to pounce on it. Um, a couple of cautions to that. Uh, one I can think of is it's, it's not necessarily that we're having negative emotions that we want to not delay. Maybe we are moved um, to respond either by someone's righteous anger or their sorrow. Um, and sometimes trying to fix the, the problem, we might accidentally say something that's not true or over promise or there, there are these other things that are coming from a good place, not a malicious place or anything bad, but um, the, the, the delay allows us to better meet our goals sometimes. And I wish there was just a, a quick checklist where <laughs> we could say delay this long in this situation and et cetera. But um, peacemaking is a practice. It's, it's uh, something we're always growing in and learning more about and, and, and trying. And um, so, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll mess up from time to time, but um, I guess that's kind of what I, what I thought about the delay. Absolutely. I, I, um appreciate both of those so much. I can, I think right now, one place I'm practicing this is in parenting. Uh, and so, um, and, and it, for some reason for me, it feels so humbling to have to say out loud, um, uh, I have a daughter who's a uh, preteen and I have so many opportunities lately to say, honey, I love you. I need some time. Uh, I need some time to think about how I want to have this conversation better with you. <laughs> and I feel upset right now. That feels so humbling to me. And so um, I can, uh, so that's one thing, it's humbling. And then the other for me is I'm just in a hurry. And I, um, I might think I can kind of fake it through, even when I'm feeling all those emotions that you guys are talking about. I might think, no, no, let me just get this one thing out. Uh, but like your question, Kippy, how many times has that gone well? It's very, it almost never, right? And so, um, so I wonder if if uh, if that's happening sometimes in our churches too. If it's um, uh, hard to just say those words uh, because we're rushing. You know, we have especially right now in 2020, our time together is limited. And so, um, well, as we pivot to close, uh, I want to say thank you guys so much for being here with us. I, I want to give you the opportunity to say um, one final thought, uh, one word of encouragement to our church leaders, um, no matter what uh, conflict they're leading through, um, uh, what uh, word of encouragement would you give them? I would say the Holy Spirit's a real thing. 
Um, and you don't have to do this by yourself, <laughs> which if you're me is great because uh, I know I can't do it by myself. But, um, and, and I would say the, uh, also the humility that you talked about, Lorianne, and also the authenticity. Um, conf I, conflict management isn't just about that moment in time. If, if people know you and know your heart and know that you're doing your best and, and um, are a part of the body just like they are, hopefully they will um, extend you the same grace and um, Holy Spirit's a real thing. And so we're, we're praying for you. And um, if there's something we can do to help you, if you want to run stuff by us, um, I know that's fine with me. I'm sure it's fine with Kippy too. Thank you, Joey. Kippy? I would just say thank you. Thank you for being willing to serve the Lord's body the way you do, because I, I can't imagine that it's normally an easy thing. There's, I know that there are some really wonderful days and some wonderful things that happen, but I also know that there, because I've worked in the church, I, I know there are really, really challenging things. And I just want to say thank you for, for what you do and your willingness to, to be there for the flock. They, they need you, they need your leadership. Um, and God has put you in a place, in, in that place, and will use you just like, like Joey said, and the Holy Spirit will, will guide you and help you. And um, yeah, peacemaking is a real thing. Uh, Sandy, uh, Ken Sandy talked about peace faking, peace uh, breaking, and peacemaking. And peacemaking is a, it's a job. It's, um, it's work, but it's, it's work that is so rewarding. And um, I just, I, I pray for you and I pray for your congregations and uh, for the, the church everywhere uh, that we're gonna be the lights that the world is in desperate need of right now. Thank you both so much, uh, Dr. Halbert and Dr. Fleming, uh, for your time today and the gift of your expertise, uh, both on this model and the application of it. Um, we really appreciate you guys. Thank you.